Hello good people and welcome back into another Parry This American History video. Today we will be discussing the life and accomplishments of Samuel Adams. He was an American statesman, political philosopher, and one of the United States' founding fathers. He helped to spur on the American War for Independence, and once he had helped win the war, became one of the men responsible for the survival and eventual flourishing nature of the budding young country. In fact, his efforts long before and during the American War for Independence would gain him the moniker of the Father of the American Revolution. So let's just dive on in and learn everything there is to know about Sam Adams. Samuel Adams was born on September 16th, 1722 in Colonial Boston. His parents were Samuel Adams Sr. and Mary Fifield Adams. Both of his parents came from prominent seafaring families in Boston and thus offered a stable and comfortable home for their family. Samuel Adams was one of 12 children born to these parents, but one of only three that lived past their third birthday. Samuel Adams Sr. was a prominent businessman in Boston and operated a malt production operation in Boston. Contrary to popular belief, he nor his son were ever brewers. They were, in fact, malters, which means that they processed barley or other grain by soaking it in water until it sprouted, and then kiln dried it. This processed grain is then known as malt, and is sold to brewers or distillers to make alcoholic beverages and liquors. In addition to being a prominent malter, Samuel Adams Sr. was a devout Puritan, and a deacon of their local parish, that being the Old South Meeting House. Samuel Adams Sr. also held a strong belief in the Massachusetts tradition of self-government, and he served in the Massachusetts colonial legislature. So Samuel Adams was raised in a household governed by strict religious adherence to Puritan doctrines and with a strong emphasis on civic activism, otherwise known as politics. The likely first impact of political formation for Samuel Adams would take place in the 1730s when he would witness arbitrary tyranny used against his father, Samuel Adams Sr. At this time, the economy of Massachusetts was stagnating and much of this stemmed from a lack of circulating currency, as much of the gold and silver currency in the colony ended up in the hands of the wealthy aristocracy, who would either hoard it or use it to purchase goods directly from Britain or elsewhere in Europe, so it never circulated back into the hands of colonial merchants and local farmers. This meant that neither the local merchants nor the farmers and craftsmen were ever able to attain any meaningful level of purchasing power. As an attempt to remedy this problem, Samuel Adams Sr., along with a handful of other wealthy Massachusetts men, would in 1739 found the Land Bank. This bank produced paper currency which it offered to borrowers who would mortgage their property in return. The land bank was very popular, especially with farmers, as it allowed them to use the currency to purchase goods from Boston merchants, who also benefited as they were in desperate need of local customers. This solution temporarily solved many problems, as it gave farmers and craftsmen more purchasing power and allowed merchants to sell more goods. However, the land bank would be strongly opposed by the court party, which was made up of wealthy British aristocracy, namely the governor and his council. These men, who were wealthy in gold and silver currency, and did not rely on the local economy for prosperity, opposed the paper currency, as it raised more people out of abject poverty, which devalued the far rarer currency of British sterling. This lowered the subjective purchasing power of the aristocracy, therefore resulting in them losing wealth, especially those who were importing foreign goods and selling them at a significant markup, but were now unable to do so as local merchants could afford to undercut them. The court party would respond by pressuring British Parliament to outlaw the land bank, which they would do in 1741. When this happened, all those who had manufactured and distributed paper currency, such as Samuel Adams Sr., were responsible for repaying it to the people who held it in silver or gold. This would place a ridiculous debt on these businessmen, including Deacon Samuel Adams, which would follow their families even after their deaths. Many of the families would of course not be able to repay these debts and would have all their properties stripped from them by the Royal Continental Government. This event would influence the young Samuel Adams and leave him with a strong distrust for government, as well as a belief that if left unobstructed, governmental bodies will strip away all individual liberties, including that of personal property. Samuel Adams was a bookish boy, more apt to spend his days indoors studying than to engage in sporting activities for which he held nothing but contempt. He would attend Boston Latin School for much of his adolescence before entering Harvard College in 1736. Adams would perform well in college, and his parents hoped that he would enter a religious ministry, but Adams favored the law and pursued an education to pursue that career. Samuel Adams would receive his undergraduate graduate degree in 1740 and his master's degree in 1743. For his master's thesis, he would argue, whether it be lawful to resist the supreme magistrate if the commonwealth cannot be otherwise preserved. This argument would show the already forming political ideology that Samuel Adams would carry for the rest of his life. This idea was that in the face of tyranny, in most cases which appeared to be totally arbitrary, whether it was within the scope of the law that governed colonial citizens to resist what they saw as a foreign authority, that being the authority of British 
Parliament. This argument would come down to representation and jurisdiction. Adams, and men like him, argued that you cannot be legally governed by a body in which you are not represented, and since they had no elected representatives in Parliament, this belief leads to the logical conclusion that Parliament could not legally govern them. Adams, and others with this belief system, posited that only local governing bodies, which they elected the members to, had the jurisdiction to govern them. This system is based on the concept of a covenant, which is an agreement based on mutual consent and mutual responsibilities. The Massachusetts Charter and the earlier Magna Carta of 1215 were considered to be covenants, as they created the ideals of government based on the consent of the people. In a covenantal government, liberty and politics work together. People can only remain free as long as they have a hand in the government that ruled them. With this understanding of the political views of Adams and his contemporaries, the events of the next few decades should be the logical conclusion of the current situation surrounding the government of the colonies at the hands of the British Parliament. Samuel Adams would go into business rather than law at the urging of his parents after graduating college. He would first attain a job at a counting house under the employ of one Thomas Cushing. However, Adams would prove to be a poor merchant as he had no interest in mercantile life nor gathering wealth. He would soon depart from the counting house, whether by his own will or that of his employer, who would state that Adams was too preoccupied with politics, which was his only obsession. After leaving Cushing's employ, Samuel Adams's father would give him a 1,000 pound loan to start his business venture. However, the young Samuel Adams, having no business sense and little grasp of personal finance, would divest himself of this money in short order, half of which would he would loan to a friend as an investment which would never pay off nor be repaid, and the other half of the money would be wasted on various other unprofitable ventures. Adams would then begin working for his father and would become a malter. This Adams would do until securing his first political office in 1747 as a clerk of the Boston Market. This was a local political chamber similar to a town council, and as clerk, Adams would mostly be responsible for record keeping and correspondence. With his political career begun, Adams would finally have his true passions kindled and would begin a real path towards the firebrand that he would become. In 1748, Adams would help found a newspaper called the Independent Advertiser, which was a weekly political publication. Adams would become a regular contributor to the popular paper, which was aimed at defending the rights and liberties of mankind. Despite being a popular publication, it would prove to be unprofitable and would cease publication in less than a year. However, the experience Adams would gain writing political pieces for this paper would only build on his already growing ability as a writer and rhetoric. In 1749, Samuel Adams would marry his first wife, a woman named Elizabeth Checkley, the daughter of Samuel Checkley, the pastor of the Old South Meeting House. Elizabeth was said to be a rare example of virtue and piety blended with a retiring and modest demeanor and the charms of elegant womanhood. By all accounts, the two had a loving marriage, which would produce six children. Unfortunately, only two of these children would live to adulthood, and Elizabeth would die in 1757 while delivering a stillborn son. Her death would devastate Samuel Adams, who would then throw himself entirely into politics. Outside of his family life, Adams would continue his political career, and in 1756 he would be elected to the position of tax collector of Boston. For the first time in his life, he would have a small guaranteed income through this position, which would provide for his family and allow him to fully dedicate himself to political work. Unfortunately, the position of tax collector would not be one that Adams would be well suited for, as he proved to be far too lenient in tax collection. It is likely that his Puritan beliefs and strong emphasis on virtue led him to empathize too well with the poor people who could not afford the taxes he was meant to collect, and he would let many of them off the hook. This failure to, to collect the requisite taxes would leave the city in the red by some two or three thousand pounds in the course of a few years. Adams would ultimately be responsible for covering this deficit, which he would of course not be able to afford to do. However, even though he was quite bad at his job, he did manage to make many connections and even a few friendships in this position. His friends would contribute to pay off his debt and would pay off approximately half of it, with the town forgiving the rest. This would, however, spell the end of Adams' career as a tax collector. The French and Indian War, as the American theater of the Seven Years' War is known, would end in 1763, seeing a British victory, but effectively doubling their national debt. As a solution, Parliament would seek to pay this debt by taxing the colonies to raise the money. The first attempt to do so would be in the Sugar Act of 1764. This act was a tax on molasses imported to the colonies from the West Indies. This would disproportionately affect Massachusetts and the other colonies of New England, whose economy economy was largely dependent on rum production. Adams would emerge as a prominent voice against the tax in the Boston Town Meeting, where he would argue, For if our trade may be taxed, why not our lands? Why not the produce of our lands and everything we possess or make use of? Adams, like his contemporaries, held the belief that to allow any tax passed by Parliament would only serve as precedent for future
future taxes on every imaginable facet of life. He would continue, If taxes are laid upon us in any shape without our having a legal representation where they are laid, are we not reduced from the charter of free subjects to the miserable state of tributary slaves? This statement frames the entire subject of taxation without representation. If the British Parliament, which the colonies have no representation in, can levy taxes upon them without their consent, then they are not free citizens of the British Empire and are instead slaves to it. This is based on the simple fact that if a foreign power can take from them the results of their labors without consent, then they are not willing participants in the production of that wealth, which is tantamount to slavery. Then in March of 1765, Parliament would pass the Stamp Act, which would require that most printed materials would bear a revenue stamp. Printed materials included legal documents, magazines, playing cards, newspapers, and many other types of paper used throughout the colonies. And it had to be paid in British currency, not in colonial paper money. This act would also include a provision that violators of this law would be tried in the Admiralty Court instead of a local jury of their peers. Adams would see this act as yet another case of arbitrary tyranny, and would openly oppose it for the same reason as the Sugar Act, as well as the added issue of removing the local jurisdiction of the courts. The result of this act would be public outrage and riots in many areas, including Boston. In Adams's view, this act violated every tenant of the covenant that he held so dear, and he would emerge as a leader during the Stamp Act crisis of 1765. He would, in this year, build a close relationship with the Loyal Nine, although he was not a member. This relationship and his leadership during the crisis would result in him emerging as a primary leader of the Popular Party, a local political party opposed to parliamentary taxation. In September of 1765, Adams would be elected to the Massachusetts General Court, which was their version of a House of Representatives. This office he would hold for nine years. He would continue to oppose and organize opposition to the Stamp Act until it was repealed by Parliament in 1766. This would be a huge victory for the colonists. However, the repeal of the Stamp Act was contingent on the passage of the Declaratory Act. This act stated that Parliament had, or ought to have, the power to make laws to govern the people of America. Of course, this attempt at a declaration of authority was undercut by the repeal of their attempted tax law, and would see a continued rise in the influence of the opposition party in the Massachusetts legislature. In this legislature were Thomas Cushing, John Hancock, James Otis, and of course, Samuel Adams, who would become the clerk. In this position, he would once again be in charge of correspondence and record keeping, and would use this position to build a network of communication, and would use it to develop communications with many like-minded leaders all around Massachusetts. Wanting to assert their authority as they had described it in the Declaratory Act, Parliament approved the Townsend Acts in 1767. This was another round of taxes on imported items, this time on many specific items such as lead, glass, paint, and tea. This being the largest attempt at taxing the colonies, it would once again draw the attention and ire of Samuel Adams, who would start the Massachusetts Circular Letter, which was a publication sent around to other cities in Massachusetts as well as to the other colonies, and would urge them all to resist this tax by boycotting all importing merchants. In this argument, Adams leaned heavily on his belief of the importance of virtue, namely the virtue of self-denial. His argument was that the items being taxed were luxury items and not needed for survival, merely for pleasure or for profit. He would call for a year-long total boycott of these products, which would initially see great cooperation. However, over time, many merchants would break away from this accord to make money. A result would be a movement of the common people to intimidate these merchants and importers to keep the boycotts alive. Riots would break out, and the Royal Massachusetts Governor would send for aid, and Britain would send 2,000 British regulars, which would land in Boston in October of 1768 and occupy the city as supposed peacekeepers. Many Bostonians, likely including Samuel Adams, would see this not as a police action of their own government, but as a foreign invasion. For two years, the British troops would patrol Boston, attempting to tamp down the spirits of the Patriot movement, largely led by the Sons of Liberty, a group to which Samuel Adams was amongst the most prominent leaders. However, the leaders of the Patriot movement would continue their work subtly. Adams himself would continue to employ his great skill at rhetoric and would write a number of political essays under the pen names Vindex and Candidus. In these articles, he would decry the commissioners of customs and the British army in Boston as oppressive tyranny that must be legally resisted. He encouraged a total boycott of all imported British goods. Many merchants supported this boycott in public, but again would allow greed to influence their actions and would secretly import and stockpile many luxury goods from Britain. As the boycott fell apart and not enough economic pressure was placed on Britain, the people of Boston began to lose patience with the boycott, and tensions began to flare in 1770. Confrontations between the citizenry and soldiers or merchants began to take place regularly. Finally, on February 22, 1770, a customs official named Ebenezer Richardson fired 
fired a warning shot into a mob that was harassing him and killed an 11-year-old boy named Christopher Cedar. The death of the young boy, although likely an accident, only fanned the flames of the people who called out for justice. Samuel Adams organized a funeral for the young boy who would become a martyr for the Patriot cause. Tensions would continue to rise until on March 5th, 1770, when a group of British soldiers would fire into a crowd of several hundred angry citizens. Five civilians were killed and six were seriously wounded. This event would become known as the Boston Massacre. Adams would lead a committee of representatives to the governor and demand the removal of all British soldiers from Boston. The governor would write to the military commander requesting that he order the withdrawal of the troops to Castle Island in the harbor, and the commander, Lieutenant Colonel Dalrymple, would comply. A trial would occur in September where all but two of the soldiers involved in the massacre would be found not guilty by a colonial court. By 1773, Parliament would seem to relent and would repeal most of the Townsend Acts, except for the tax on tea. They would then pass the Tea Act, which would grant the East India Company a monopoly on the tea trade. Parliament's plan here was two-pronged and simple. First, they would be bailing out the financially failing East India Company, which was a huge part of their mercantile economy. And second, they would finally establish a precedent for taxing the colonies. By repealing most of the Townsend Acts, Parliament was attempting to lull the colonists into a false sense of security by only keeping the relatively small tea tax in place. Then they set up a contract where the East India Company would be able to offer tea to the colonies cheaper than anyone else, including merchants in England and even American smugglers who were importing Dutch tea. They hoped that the Americans would buy the tea from the East India Company because even with the three pence per pound tax, it would still be by far the cheapest tea that they could buy. In this way, Parliament hoped to exploit the greed of the colonists at the best price and sneak in the tax, thus setting a precedent for Parliament to impose legal taxes on them. However, Samuel Adams would not be fooled by this subterfuge and would immediately oppose it. Samuel Adams would again use the Committee of Correspondence to get the word out to the other colonies about what was happening and to organize a boycott of all tea imported by the East India Company. Most of the colonies were able to assert enough pressure on their governors to either turn the ships away or were able to take the goods and store them in damp cellars where the goods would spoil and therefore not enter the market, as was the case in Philadelphia. However, the governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, would not bow to political pressure from the local government. He and the merchants who had been chosen to sell the tea in Massachusetts, two of which were, the gov were Governor Hutchinson's sons, would refuse to be intimidated. On November 28th, the Dartmouth, the first of the tea ships heading for Boston, would arrive in the harbor. The Beaver and the Eleanor would soon follow. The Sons of Liberty would post guards at the docks and would prevent the ships from offloading the tea, and would instruct the ship's owners to turn the ships around and take the tea back to Britain. However, the ship's owners would not comply, as Governor Hutchinson had positioned two military frigates outside the bay with orders to destroy the ships if they attempted to leave without offloading the tea. On December 16th, Adams chaired a meeting at the Old South Meeting Hall as a final attempt to resolve the matter legally. At this time, the attendees sent the owner of the Beaver and the Dartmouth, John Rowe, to ask Governor Hutchinson to allow him to depart without offloading the tea. The governor would refuse this request, and Samuel Adams would announce, this meeting can do nothing more to save the country. Historians debate as to whether this was a prearranged signal or if the crowd simply lost patience at this point. But a large group of them departed the hall, and between 30 and 130 men, some of which disguised as Mohawk Indians, went to the harbor, boarded the ships, and dumped 342 chests of tea into the harbor, destroying it. Estimates suggest that the value of the tea destroyed here would be in excess of $1 million today adjusted for inflation. There is no evidence that Adam took part in the Boston Tea Party or even organized it. However, he did defend it as the last resort of a people who have exhausted all legal avenues of protest in the face of tyranny. He praised the Boston Tea Party, saying, You cannot imagine the height of joy that sparkles in the eyes and animates the countenances as well as the heart of all we meet on this occasion. When news of the Boston Tea Party reached Britain in 1774, Parliament passed the Coercive Acts in response. This legislation consisted of four bills. The first was the Boston Port Bill, which closed the port of Boston to all trade until Massachusetts paid restitution for the full value of the tea that was dumped into the harbor. The second part was the Massachusetts Government Act, which stripped Massachusetts of its charter and limited town meetings to one per year. The third part was the Administration of Justice Act, which allowed for the trials of accused royal officials and military personnel to take place in Britain instead of the local jurisdiction where any supposed crime had taken place, thus removing them from continental authority. The final part of the Coercive Acts was the Quartering Act, which allowed the royal governor to house soldiers in other buildings if suitable quarters were not provided. This included warehouses, places of business, inns, taverns, congregation halls, and even occupied private homes. Many colonists, not just in Massachusetts, saw the Coercive Acts as a violation of their natural rights and their colonial charters, and therefore as a 
threat to the liberties of all the colonies and not just Massachusetts. Far from stamping down the growing revolution, the coercive acts were in many ways the last straw which would plunge most colonists deeply into conflict against the British. To enforce these laws, which were widely despised, General Thomas Gage was appointed as the military governor of the province and brought 4,000 troops to garrison Boston and the surrounding areas. In June of 1774, Samuel Adams would respond by convening a meeting of the Massachusetts House of Representatives now meeting in Salem. At this meeting, Adams was selected as one of the representatives to be sent to Philadelphia to attend the First Continental Congress. While Adams was at the First Continental Congress discussing the situation in Massachusetts, his friend, Joseph Warren, remained in Massachusetts and formed an opposition government called the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which would meet in October of 1774. They would assume all legislative, financial, and military power for the colony outside of Boston. Adams would remain in communication with Warren and would help pen their founding document, the Suffolk Resolves, as well as organizing and creating the Massachusetts Militia, known as the Minutemen. When the Continental Congress adjourned in November with the intent to reconvene in May of 1775, if the situation in Massachusetts had not been resolved, Adams returned to Massachusetts where he took up his spot of, on the Provincial Congress. He would work tirelessly for five months to obtain and distribute aid to the people of Boston who were suffering from the port closure. During the fall and winter, the Provincial Congress would attempt to secure military equipment, including muskets, ammunition, powder, and cannons in a race against General Gage, who was attempting to seize it all first. However, as of spring, no armed conflict had yet happened. With the situation looking no better, a second Continental Congress was deemed necessary, and Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, and Robert Payne were selected to attend as delegates. John Hancock and Samuel Adams were to attend the session of the Provincial Congress in Concord be before leaving for Philadelphia, but were staying in Lexington to avoid arrest. General Gage ordered a column of troops to attack Concord and seize and destroy a cache of military supplies that was suspected to be there. Learning of this movement, Joseph Warren dispatched Paul Revere on April 19th to warn both Hancock and Adams to leave to avoid arrest, and the two would leave for Philadelphia. As Hancock and Adams escaped, two skirmishes between the Minutemen and the British military would happen at Lexington Green and Concord's North Bridge. This would mark the official beginning of the American Revolution. At the Second Continental Congress, Hancock and Adams would represent the needs of Massachusetts and would emerge as primary voices for independence. They would vote to create a Continental Army, and Samuel Adams would nominate George Washington to act as Commander-in-Chief instead of John Hancock, who also had popular support for that office. During the Second Continental Congress, they would be notified of the Battle of Bunker Hill and would also order the invasion of Canada. On June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia would propose a resolution calling for independence from Britain. Following several weeks of debate, Congress adopted the resolution on July 2nd, 1776. Then on July 4th, 1776, Adams would cast his vote to ratify the Declaration of Independence and after it passed, would be one of the first to sign it. So on this day, 33 years after he had written it, Adams finally answered his own question as it was posed in his master's thesis, whether it be lawful to resist the Supreme Magistrate if the Commonwealth cannot be otherwise preserved. Adams' answer was apparently yes. Samuel Adams would spend the majority of the Revolution working in the Continental Congress, where he would serve on various military committees, including the Board of War in 1777. He was an advocate for paying bonuses to soldiers to get them to re-enlist, and also called for harsh state legislation to punish Loyalists, who were American citizens who continued to support the British Crown. In 1776, he gave a speech in Philadelphia where he dressed down Americans who chose to side with the Crown, saying, If ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude than the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. Adam said, We ask not your counsels or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. In this way, Adams made clear his position regarding the people whom he viewed as traitorous to the independence movement. While serving in the Continental Congress, Samuel Adams helped to write and pass the Articles of Confederation. The emphasis of this document was on state sovereignty, and it reflected a wariness of a strong central government, which was a concern shared by Adams himself. Adams would leave the Continental Congress in 1779 and return to Boston, where he would be given a seat at the state's Constitutional Convention. At this convention, Adams would help to write and pass the new Massachusetts Constitution, which was amended and ratified in 1780. The remainder of Samuel Adams' career was spent in state politics, as he never held a federal office. Throughout the 1780s, Adams would serve as the president of Massachusetts Senate, and from 1789 to 1793, he would serve as lieutenant governor of the state under Governor John Hancock. During this time in state politics, a third Continental Congress would form to replace the weak Articles of Confederation with a 
new document intended to strengthen the federal government. The result would be the U.S. Constitution, which Samuel Adams would initially oppose, given how distrustful he was of the idea of a strong central government, given his experience with governments such as the stripping away of individual freedoms and liberty. Eventually, after promises of later amendments to address his concerns, Adams would lend his support to the Constitution and would vote to ratify it, being largely responsible for its narrow ratification in Massachusetts. Adams would then continue to work for the amendments to the Constitution that would ultimately take shape in the Bill of Rights in 1791. After the addition of these amendments, which protected what Samuel Adams saw as, as inherent and unalienable human rights from the whims of the federal government, he became an ardent supporter of the Constitution. In 1793, John Hancock would die in office, and Adams would become the interim governor of Massachusetts. Adams would then be elected as governor and would serve three successive one-year terms before retiring from politics in 1797. During his time as governor, Adams supported the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion by military means, as he felt the perpetrators were committing treason. The Whiskey Rebellion, in simple terms, was the refusal to pay a tax on distilled spirits by a group of whiskey producers. Adams did not see this as a contradiction to his values, as he saw the government, which had passed this tax, as legitimate and within their rights to pass such a tax, as they had been elected by the people whom the tax was imposed upon. Adams clarified that opposition to such a tax must be done through the polls, and not through violent means. This set a precedent which the United States is supposed to hold to this day. Samuel Adams would die at the age of 81 on October 2nd, 1803, and would be interred at the Granary Burying Grounds in Boston. Despite later accounts by historians in the 19th and 20th century that depicted Samuel Adams as a slanderous propagandist who controlled the mobs of Boston to instigate the revolution, most of which have been thoroughly debunked as pro-Tory propaganda, history generally looks very kindly on Samuel Adams as a morally upright and dedicated politician who helped deliver the colonies out of the yoke of tyranny and into the free nation that they would become. Two quotes from Samuel Adams' contemporaries illustrate the character of this man better than anything else I could write. In 1819, Thomas Jefferson wrote of Samuel Adams, I can say that he was truly a great man wise in counsel, fertile in resources, immovable in his purposes. Although not of fluent elocution, he was so rigorously logical, so clear in his views, abundant in good sense, and master always of his subject, that he commanded the most profound attention whenever he rose in an assembly. And of course, then writing of his cousin Samuel Adams, John Adams professed that he had the most thorough understanding of liberty, was zealous and keen in the cause, and that he embodied steadfast integrity and universal good character. And so, here we end our biography of the father of the American Revolution.